Let's talk about autoimmune diseases and vitamin D. You know, I'm continually surprised that so many people who have one, two, or three autoimmune diseases often don't know that vitamin D plays a crucial role in allowing those diseases to emerge. So we know with confidence that people who have low blood levels of vitamin D are much more susceptible to conditions like type 1 diabetes, or rheumatoid arthritis, or ulcerative colitis, or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so that low blood vitamin D somehow allows something else to initiate the process of autoimmunity, that is, the um, uh, body's immune system attacks some organ and does damage. Now, think of vitamin D not as a cause for an autoimmune disease. Think of vitamin D deficiency as what I call a permissive factor. That is, if you're deficient in vitamin D, it's more likely that some other cause can initiate the autoimmune, autoimmune process. So for instance, a child prone to type 1 diabetes because of genetics is much more likely, many fold more likely to develop type 1 diabetes if they're exposed to the gliadin protein of wheat and related proteins of grains. That's established fact, by the way, not my speculation. And so having a low blood level of vitamin D raises the likelihood that some other factor will initiate the autoimmune process. So what constitutes a good level of vitamin D? Well, my view, a level of 60 to 70 nanograms per milliliter. And I, I set that range because of several reasons. One, at that range, virtually all the phenomena of vitamin D deficiency, all the unhealthy phenomena, like bone thinning, loss of muscle, seasonal affective disorder, uh, seasonal blues, uh, inflammatory markers, everything normalizes maximally when you achieve that level. Also, one of the most powerful signs for vitamin D sufficiency, adequacy, is dropping your parathyroid hormone level. All that means, there's a hormone called parathyroid hormone that goes up when you're deficient in vitamin D and that's part of your body's effort to maintain a normal blood calcium. And so a parathyroid hormone causes you to mobilize calcium from your bones, which is not a good thing, right? It thins and weakens your bones. Maximal suppression of PTH and thereby sparing of your bones, preservation of your bone, uh, occurs at a level of 60 nanograms per milliliter of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And we know that if you're a young person, say you're in your teens or 20s, and you spend a lot of time outside, maybe you're um, a life, uh, lifeguard in Miami wearing a bathing suit with lots of surface area exposed to the sun and lots of uh, tropical sun, your blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D will be something like 84, 88, 92, telling us that that is a physiologically appropriate level to achieve just with sun exposure. And telling us that if we achieve, say, 60 to 70, it's not going to be toxic. And that, and in fact, I have never seen uh, not a single episode of toxicity in people who take vitamin D to achieve a blood level of 60 to 70 nanograms per milliliter. Now, some people say, well, can I just get sun? Well, you can if you're young, meaning typically younger than 30 years old, and have a lot of surface area exposed to a strong sun. So if you live where I live, which is in, in the Midwest, upper northern Midwest, you can't get sun most of the year. It's too cold, you're wearing clothes, sun is too weak. And so uh, even in summer, it's not always that easy to get enough vitamin D. Another issue to be aware of, that uh, as we age, you lose the capacity to activate vitamin D in the skin. Most people do. Such that by age 50, 60, 70, you can have a nice dark tan and still be deficient in vitamin D. So the need for oral supplementation of vitamin D becomes more and more uh, necessary, more uh, beneficial, the older you get. Now, uh, if you've watched some of my other videos on vitamin D, or have visited my Wheat Belly blog or Undoctored blog, or read any of my books, Wheat Belly books or Undoctored books, you know I advocate that people take uh, an oil-based gel cap form of vitamin D. I've just seen too many people take tablet forms and have vo virtually no rise in blood level. Very frustrating. If you have, a, let's say, a, a very low blood level of vitamin D, say of 13 nanograms per, per milliliter, and you take 10,000 units of vitamin D as a tablet form, and you come back six months later, we recheck a blood level, and it's 16. Hardly any uh, movement at all. And I've seen this so darn many times. Tablet forms are very erratically absorbed, often not absorbed at all. While you can force absorption by consuming a fatty meal, 
I find even then it's just too erratic and it's not worth it. There's, there's no benefit to taking tablets. They're not cheaper. They're not more effective. Oil-based gel caps, which are widely available, very inexpensive, are your choice. Drops are okay, particularly for children, but you'll find that blood levels they generate are very erratic, very variable. So just try to be as consistent as possible when you use drops. The most consistent, reliable form of vitamin D is in oil-based gel caps. Now, what kinds of factors could initiate an autoimmune condition? Well, there's several. One is the gliadin protein of wheat and related proteins of other grains, particularly the cyclin of rye, the hordein of barley, and the zein of corn. Those proteins are known to provoke, to initiate autoimmune diseases. In some people, the casein beta A1, that form of casein that's prevalent in North America, can also initiate uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, and lastly, SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because part of SIBO, that is proliferation of unhealthy bacterial species that ascend up from the colon into the ileum, jejunum, duodenum, and stomach, that proliferation of unhealthy bacterial species is accompanied by an increase in intestinal permeability and it allows foreign substances, both food uh, breakdown products as well as bacterial breakdown products to gain entry into the bloodstream and that is hugely inflammatory and one of the potential consequences of that is an autoimmune disease tricking the body into attacking uh, one of its own organs so the gliadin protein of wheat the casein beta a1 protein of dairy and uh, SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth now these are uh, take us into some more advanced topics. I invite you to join my conversations, my Wheat Belly blog, Undoctored blog, and of course my books. Uh, if you want the most recent compilation of the entire program, uh, how we're doing it currently, I've uh, got a new book called Wheat Belly, the revised and expanded edition that updates all these conversations and draws from all the lessons we've learned over the past nine years in this international experience uh, that is yielding some pretty extraordinary successes.